Yeah, go ahead, Jill. For those of you who don't know, I have a nephew that I did not know about until just recently. So that's the praise report. But continue prayer. I know Ashley prayed for Saber, you know, a couple a few weeks ago. And that went well. So thank you for those prayers. Um, but Carrie and Wesley have family that they're going to meet on September, the week of September 18th. So keep that in your prayers. All right. All right. Thank you, John. Any others? Any other announcements we need to mention this morning? Mm -hmm. If there are no other announcements at this time, I ask you to prepare your hearts for worship. join together in worshiping, standing as you're able for, and, and if you have your hymnals, turn to page 334, will the words be on our screen? Yes, alright, so stand, words will be on our screen, or you can turn to page 334 in your hymnal for <coughs> sweet, sweet <song. coughs>
come to our service where we open up uh, and let everyone share their praise reports and prayer concerns. to be keeping uh, schools in our prayer and all the students and teachers involved. Any others? Continue prayers for Kim. He's at home waiting. He's at the place to the hospital waiting. Um, he's probably in his home. Thank you. 
Yes. We need to put our next door neighbor, Dennis, and Dave on the prior list. Uh, you ready to thing on the time that he's worse than us. Okay. And he has, I heard, cancer, lung cancer? He's been diagnosed with lung cancer. Okay. So let's, yeah, let's keep Dennis Day in our prayers, reach out to him, give him our love and support in our prayers. Any others this morning? I just thank God for another beautiful day. Amen. Amen. Any others? I got a praise report. Uh, Brooke passed all her uh, licensing exams, so now she can deal with drugs legally. Oh, my God. <laughs> praise the Lord. <laughs> Congratulations, Brooke. That's all. Awesome. Any others this morning? I'm probably going to get in trouble for I didn't get in trouble. But it's somebody in my family's birthday. It's Katie's birthday this week. <laughs> On Tuesday. <laughs> to keep her in your prayers, because I tip I tip the surprise her. What now? Yeah, I probably should have. Give me your prayers. <laughs> Any others this morning? Let's go before the Lord in prayer. I'll give you a few moments of silence. This altar is always open if you wish uh, to come and pray. Let's pray. Mm -hmm.
Now it's time where we worship the Lord through the givings of our tithes and offerings. Have our ushers come forward at this time. Join together in a hymn of preparation. Mm -hmm. 
nothing but the blood. It's on page 362. If you'll stand as you are able, let's join together in worship. Trips, right? We talked about this 
summer trips or sort of all kinds of different trips. I know for me, uh, when I was in seminary, there was a, you know, it was about a six hour drive to, from my home here and, and back there, and there were certain parts that I just dread. There were most of the parts that I loved, right? Beautiful scenery, got to go through the Cumberlands uh, in, in Tennessee and Virginia. It was beautiful, beautiful scenery, but there were parts that just Oh, and it just felt like so long, just, just boring stretches of land. Even coming back this week from seeing a, a Katie's sister graduate, I knew coming back, I knew there was going to be one part of that I just, oh, I just didn't look forward to. It was just this long stretch of nothing. Just interstate and trees, right? I just got get bored, you know? And sure enough, we were coming back, and we hit gridlock traffic on the interstate. And that stretch, too. Nothing to look at. <laughs> Katie was asleep. My husband was asleep. Nobody talked to you. Just sitting there twiddling my thumbs. Just stuck in traffic on the interstate. But there's some trips, some parts of trips that we just hate. Maybe even some trips that we wish we could just avoid <laughs> altogether. <coughs> Same can be true, I think, of prophets. And whether it's verses or chapters or even books, there's probably some that we would just prefer to skip. Maybe avoid. Just, you know, not worry about. Just not have to read. Maybe even there are some trips, right, that we could equate to, to passages like this. The same analogy of places that we just don't want God to take us. Sometimes we might think that God's taking us to the proverbial woodshed to be disciplined. Or sometimes, as in our scripture this passage this morning, it might feel like we're getting taken to court. And that's what this passage sounds like. How God brings about this disciplinary prophetic word. To be a prophet or a crusader for God, there will be times, though, when we will have to ruffle feathers. And even that may be a trip that we don't want to take. But then we will have to. We'll have to take a stand. And in that stand for God's holiness, justice, and love, we might ruffle a few feathers. And it might be easy. Probably the easiest way, the easy way out of all this mess would be to think that the prophets are not speaking to us. And maybe the prophets are speaking to a people long ago and it's not applicable for us today. And in fact, I think these words are just as important for us today as they were back then. Most prophets don't have a lot of time to waste. And they get right into it. Same for Isaiah. Isaiah starts his letter off. We didn't get to read it this morning, but if you go back to verse 1 of, his, of chapter 1, he starts his letter off by listing these kings and rulers. Basically, he's calling them out, also telling you when and what time he is sort of ministering, so that way you can know what's going on in the people and the land. There's an urgency to, the, to prophecy. The Word of God is often just thrust into our face. And... Our eyes, when we hear it, are opened to the reality or the sin around us. And if you've been listening to this passage, this passage or this this series, this passage may seem like a lot of other passages we've read. But the interesting thing is, is that Isaiah addresses a very important aspect of, of our faith. He addresses our worship. And as God begins to bring this prophetic word. There's these slight moments where he begins to make these comments about what is wrong. Why he is rejecting the people of Israel's worship. God summons the people to give an account for their behavior. And a lot of this unfolds like uh, an ancient lawsuit would. Like you're being called to court to answer for your crimes. Yahweh the judge has showed up and court is in session, right? Kind of like, the, what's that show, Law and Order, with the gal, doom, doom, right? This is, this is it. It's, there's no, the case is being had, you're called to court, and if you don't show up, you're going to be in contempt. And really, it's not a case you can argue either. There's a contrast between Lord's, the Lord's faithfulness and Israel's rebellion. There's a lack of knowing and understanding, and with that, the, there's a connotation or understanding of um, lack of respect. Lack of acknowledging and serving God. And through that, the people are unable to know or even make the choice between right and wrong. 
And in verse 10, God summons the people, not just the people of Israel, but the leaders first, right? He calls them, oh, leaders of Sodom, right? He's, he's basically telling the people of Jerusalem, of Israel, the leaders, that they're like Sodom. And the people, they're like Gomorrah. Their ways, their, their deeds, their lives, their communities are evil. And it's time to answer for their crimes. As God brings his prophetic holy word, there's some good things and bad things. But he begins to reject their worship. And he gives this list of things that he, he, he rejects and then ends with this deep-hearted, emphatic plea for justice. He rejects their, their sacrifices, all their various kinds of sacrifices. This would include gifts that would be burned on an altar. He, he includes burnt offerings of animals. And this is, like I said, this is only, burnt offerings are only one gift, one sacrifice that you can make. He rejects their celebrations, their processions. He says that they trample his courts by coming into them in this way. He rejects their offerings, their incense. This would, again, would be just one of the many gifts that people would bring to God to show their worship, their devotion. He rejects their, their, all their forms of religious celebration, from their festivals and feasts to worship services. And then in the most radical rejection, God even rejects their prayers. And through all this, you see, just, just little like, you don't want to say snide, but just little, little cutting remarks where God begins to, to tell them why. I don't want you to proceed in and show me reverence because you're trampling. It's not a disrespect, but who, is, who are they trampling? I don't, your prayers mean nothing to me. Why? Because when they open up their hands, the, the, the passage says when you lift up your hands, you open up your hands, that's a sign that refers to the way that they would pray. You open up your hands, your hands are covered in the blood of innocent lives. Their worship has been tainted because they have tried to hide and pretend that they haven't sinned. There is this lack of respect Irreverence. They're trampling over the innocents. And as they outstretch their hands to pray, the true nature of their sin and who they are is being revealed. Their lives are covered with sin and the blood of innocent. They've trampled the weak. They've indulged in greed and gluttony. Basically, God comes to the conclusion that there is no need for a trial. We can argue all you want, but you are, your sins are like crimson. They, are, they have stained your entire being. There's no defense you can give. There's no excuse that can be made. All the sacrifices and prayers and festivals will never make it right. You cannot Save yourself through them. You cannot make me save you through it either. I think this tells us something very deep and important about worship. That living a life of obedience to the Lord's will, holiness, and justice, and love is fundamental to worship. Worship is only true when we give attention to God's justice and God's love and forgiveness and God's word in our daily lives. And there's a lack of concern, though, for the posture of worship, though, the attitude or knowledge of the worshiper in this passage in much of the Old Testament. It's not about how you worship in terms of whether you worship with an organ or a piano or a cappella or a choir or electric guitar and drums. None of that matters. What matters is not right thinking. It's not about knowing who God is. Or knowing why you come and worship. But instead it's about right actions. It's about preparation. Preparing our hearts and our lives. And to wash ourselves in preparation for worship. Is to deal justly 
and to obey God's word in specific ways. To love God and to love others. So when we fail in obedience, our worship becomes meaningless. It becomes burdensome to God, he says. When we fail to proclaim the good news, our offerings become pointless. When we fail to help the least of these, we cannot be faithful in true worship. God speaks to us and reveals his word. And when he does so, it reveals our sins, our wickedness. And God's holy judgment upon our sinful ways may seem harsh. I think that oftentimes, because we are finite, we are mortal people, when we encounter God's word that brings correction to us. In our pridefulness, we hear God lecture us or judge our actions or tell us we're lost and sinful or immoral. immoral. And I think we, in our, our finite minds, we, we want to say, I'm only human, right? I, 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 I'm only human. I, I'm going to make mistakes. But we use that phrase like it's a crutch, like it's an insult to who God made us as human beings. The problem is that we define we have to find what it means to be human. I'm only human. Instead of hearing what God tells us, it means to be made human in His image. We may only be human, but to be human is to be created with the goodness, love, and the image of God Almighty. It is to be the embodiment in the world of God's love and will on earth as it is in heaven. So we are so much more than what we often mean when we say we are only human and try and escape the consequences of our decisions. Will we make mistakes? Yes. Will we sin and choose to turn away from God at times? Yes. But choosing that, choosing to turn away from God, it's not what we were created to be as human. Sin was never the intention of God for us. So when God says to us, you have sinned, come back to me. You have blood on your hands. Your sin is like crimson. It's like red. God is saying is you have made yourself into what you were never intended to to be. And what we say is to be human is to be actually, in fact, less than human. It is to be a fallen human. To be human is to bear God's image in the world. It is to worship God in holiness. And that doesn't mean coming here and saying the right things. Or knowing who God is, or knowing all the Bible verses. It's about knowing and then allowing God to change who we are, to raise us up into who He did create us to be as humans. It's to bear God's image in the world and to be the embodiment of God's love. To be human is not to be sinful. God created us to be far more and above than what our sinful states are that we're born into. And that's what Isaiah is, is trying to convey. That's what the Lord is trying to tell us. That we can hide behind all the pageantry of, of worship. We can try and make ourselves think that we're, we're better, that we're okay, that we're worshiping the true God. But if we're not living God's love if we're not living as God created us to be as humans then it's all meaningless it doesn't matter how many songs we sing or how many offerings we give or how much we do give in the offering plate or how many Bible verses we can quote what matters is not just knowing but understanding and being able to show that respect and devotion to God so the Lord turns from what is rejected and reminds us of what is required, of what He 
requires from us and what it truly means to be human. He shows us what we are capable of by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Turn from what you are doing. Stop being what you think is human. Stop dirtying yourselves. Come to me and I will wash you by the blood of the Lamb. Instead, learn to do good. Seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, and plead for the widow. The Lord stops accusing at this point because, like I said, we're already guilty. We know it. There's no arguing. There's no way to get around it. But if you come to me, God says, I will wash you clean. And I will show you what it means to be human. But doing justice, loving God, and loving others, it's hard work. It's really hard work. Learning what it means to be human is hard. Because it, it means learning to know what God's will is. But it becomes possible with Jesus Christ. It becomes possible because of the work of the community together. And it should be. As we come together and we do the ministry that God is calling us to do, it has to be more than just getting out and doing something. It has to be more than that. It has to be, this is who we are. And that is why we are moved to do good, to do just, to help the oppressed, or the orphan, or the widow. Why don't you come and experience it? That's the only way we can learn to do good as a community. And that's what Isaiah pleads for us to do. Not just to worship, but to make sure that our worship doesn't just happen on Sunday mornings. And to, and to do the prophetic work is to engage in this ministry of warning at times. Like Isaiah and Jeremiah and all these other prophets that we've been talking about. And there's a lot of warning that needs to be done. Not a lot, a lot of warning needs to be preached. And not just from a pulpit, folks. But we can no longer pretend that God isn't concerned about the world the social, the political, the economic, the theological instability of the world. He cares about it all. And we all are a part of every aspect of that. We no longer can believe that we can just go to worship on Sunday mornings and then ignore God's calling to be holy and to love others and help others, help the oppressed and make disciples. We can't ignore that on Monday. We can no longer pretend that the gospel is just for the individual and not for the community, the city, the nation, the world. We can no longer pretend that God has turned a blind eye to those who are the least among us. And here's the thing about being a prophet in the margins. It's that sometimes God will take us on a trip. And that trip will lead us to the very center of it all. The center of all the chaos and all the sin and all the unfaithfulness to God's teaching. It will, God will lead us to lead from the center. <coughs> so what is our warning for this day? Where has God pushed us and placed us in the center of? Because if he has, there's something that we are called to say. And if we get stuck with answering that question, what has God called us to say? What center has God placed us in today? There's somebody that can help us. It's the prophets. It's God's word through the prophets. In verse 19 and 20, he, Isaiah says this. To remind you again, he says, If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Reap the benefits of God's covenant and promises. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, it's our turn. We must go and speak. Now our lives must go and preach the good news through our holy living And through that, we will learn to do good. What it means to be just. What it means to be holy. How we can better help the widow, the oppressed, the poor, the orphan.
how we can better love the sinner, how we can better minister to the sick and the dying and the addicted and the lost and the broken hearted. But now we must go because we all have it in our hearts. We all know what our mission is. We've come here and we've worshipped. But our worship today will mean nothing if we wake up tomorrow morning and we forget it all. That is the word of Isaiah this morning. Thanks be to God that we have a Savior. He died on the cross and by His blood we have been made clean. We have been given eternal life. Amen. Let's pray. For God Almighty, you are our God of our redemption. Lord, you call us to wash ourselves clean so that our transgressions will fall away. Lord, today may we cease doing evil. May we learn to do good and seek justice. For you call us to rescue the oppressed, to defend the orphan, to plead for the widows. May we not forget these responsibilities that you have given to us. Lord, in our hearts, we are grateful. Grateful for the reminder from the prophet Isaiah, from all the other prophets, from every person that you've ever sent to our lives to remind us that our sins are like scarlet, but will wash us and make us like snow. Even though our sins are like crimson, you will redeem us and make us clean like wool. So Lord, may you lead us and show us how to be obedient, willing followers. Lord, may we be eager to please you every single day. May our worship not be in vain today. But may we encounter your presence here so that others may encounter your presence through us out there. We pray for all this in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's close our service with one final hymn. Take time to be holy. I believe my memory serves you right. It's on page 395 in the hymn. words beyond your screen. Let's stand and join together in worship. Take time to be holy.
receive this blessing and benediction. May the Lord God Almighty, may He open your mind so that you may know and learn and grow in His grace. May He open up your mind, eyes so that you may see His glory. May He open up your hearts so that you may love and share His love with all those you encounter. And may God's grace and Spirit be upon you as you depart from here today into His mission field. Amen.